All right, I am Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. This is Barbell Medicine Instagram Live. Well, you guys already know that because you're here. You know about these lives. And if you don't, welcome. What we do here is, what I do here is answer your questions. It's No Shave November also, so we got the, we got the stash. I, sometimes I forget that I have a mustache and I'm walking around. And I, I feel like this is the first year that I, I don't look like an idiot, um, like, a, like a kid wearing my dad's mustache. Maybe that's just because I, I am of age to be a dad. Unclear. We'll, we'll, have, to, we'll have to ask the, the audience members here. So in any case, Party Pats, what's your question, caller? What is your favorite cholesterol-reducing medication for the gen pop? Should I try to get the crazy monoclonal antibody that blocks the LDL receptor reuptake protein? Uh, no. So you're, you're talking about a PCSK9 inhibitor, although the, the study just came out, I believe it was last week, for uh, where it showed that a PCSK9 inhibitor um, was good for primary prevention in heart disease. Basically means if you've never had a heart attack, it actually prevents you people from having a heart attack or they, there was major adverse cardiac events um, due to how powerful it and how the large magnitude of cholesterol lowering from that. That said, most people would do fine with a statin. Um, it's very cheap, uh, easy, easy, to get, easy to get. Now, if, if, you, if the question is, do you need it? Depends on your risk. And so, yeah, there's, there's a lot to that. And we've published a lot on um, cholesterol lowering. And so just briefly, when you think about cholesterol and its risk towards uh, heart disease, in this case, the risk is proportional to the exposure. Basically, that means the higher your atherogenic load, and the longer you've been exposed to it, the more risk you're going to get from um, cholesterol. And actually, in this case, the lipoproteins that carry the cholesterol around the body. And specifically, we're talking about things like LDL, triglycerides, and anything that has an apolipoprotein B uh, on it. These are, that's your atherogenic load. And so the higher, uh, the more particles that you have, so the higher the count, and the longer you're exposed to that without any sort of mitigation, um, the worse it is. And it seems like the lower uh, it goes, the better. And we're talking about uh, lowering levels down to, you know, neonate levels. So I don't know what your levels are. And this is not medical advice. This is edutainment, but lower is better. And people will invariably say, no, look at this study. It's an observational study. It shows that people with lower cholesterol levels um, tend to, uh, there's more mortality there. They die sooner. And that is because there are medical conditions that actually, by virtue of that medical condition, cause um, low cholesterol, like cancers, for example, will, will tend to cause a lowering of cholesterol levels. But when we see people who have uh, genetic mutations that actually keeps their cholesterol levels low um, life for low, their lifetime, they have the lowest risk of heart disease, period. So lower is better. Whether or not you need a medication, that's something you should take up with your physician. Um, I don't think starting with the PCSK9 inhibitor is what I would do. Um, I'd probably fa favor a statin plus or minus a zetamib if, if someone needs it or, or something like that. But yeah, you know, some people would benefit from a uh, PCSK9 inhibitor as well. David Rodriguez, 168. Hey, Doc, why are a lot of fitness influencers like I think that was an autocorrect, um, advocating for very low volume training to failure? Is this trend because of because high intensity is greater than hypertrophy? I think what this question is getting at is, is higher intensity more productive than higher volume training for hypertrophy? And I would just say simply, no, that's not really the case. The, both factors are related. And so I, I think about this as almost like a functional threshold. Um, for hypertrophy training, for example, there is no like minimum intensity, meaning that you could theoretically train with like as low as 30% of your one rep max or as heavy as, you know, 90%, 85% of your one rep max. Um, so really anything between like three and 20, three and 25, three and 30 reps, if you're doing, you know, blood flow restriction stuff, uh, at the, at that high end. Um, the point is you have to get somewhere near failure, right? And we're talking at least, you know, four or five reps, uh, uh, left before you would you would get to task failure, um, and so at, at that point, if once you're at that threshold, then the relationship that you see between training and hypertrophy is a dose dependent relationship between volume. The higher the volume is, generally the more uh, hypertrophy people get, provided that they can tolerate it. And usually, there's like an on ramp where people are sort of getting used to it or accommodating 
um, towards the training load and then they start growing, or at least we can actually pick up the muscle growth a few weeks, a few weeks in. So like week three, week four, that's when you can kind of detect it. Some of that's due to the testing issue. Um, like how do you actually just measure, um, very small, minute amounts of hypertrophy, but yeah, that, that's kind of what happens. Now, once you get north of, you know, uh, it's definitively high volume and admittedly there's no um, consensus on what is low volume, what is moderate volume, what is high volume. We're all just kind of making it up. But when you think about doing uh, more than, let's say, 15 sets per week, 20 sets per week certainly would qualify. At that point, vol the volume lever has been kind of pulled, right? It's been pulled. And for hypertrophy at that point, then intensity is the other lever that you'd want to pull. And so taking more of those sets closer to failure would probably get you more hypertrophy than adding more volume. Um, so that's, that's the thing there, but advising people to do low volume intensity or low volume, um, training to failure to be, uh, being superior to higher volume training at that functional threshold, that is not consistent with the research. So it's an option, um, just not like an optimal one. And, and you know, generally speaking, when I'm thinking about programming, I want people to do as much training as possible, right? And the two biggest bottlenecks are time um, and then their physiological tolerance. So logistical tolerance, time mostly, and then physiological tolerance, how much can they recover from? More training, generally speaking, more training load specifically um, generates more fitness adaptations, more health adaptations, and so on and so forth. So doing less than that can work, but there's still you're leaving gains on the table. Chris Anzari. What is the ideal way to regulate volume? Adjust based on if I'm seeing progressive overload or not? Oof, yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. So regulating volume um, insinuates that there's some sort of dynamic adjustment that needs to be made um, throughout uh, a microcycle, so like one week of training, or a mesocycle, so like a training block. Uh, and I don't know that that has to happen. You, there are ways to do that. Uh, so for example, I could prescribe a workup to a set of five reps on the squat at RP seven, and then do three more back off sets, uh, but terminate the set once you hit RP six. And so on a good day, you're going to do more reps, more volume than on a day where your performance is down. That's one way to regulate volume. I like doing that if somebody's training resources and recovery resources are more dynamic. Um, that said, the total volume doesn't actually change that much. And a person who's going to like a powerlifting meet, for example, and who presumably has uh, a lot of resources to train, sometimes I worry that we're not getting enough training volume. In. And so in that case, I would do an alternative prescription, five reps at RP7, then do 20 total uh, more reps no set uh, is higher than RP7, adjust the reps per set um, to, to meet that RPE cap. So that's how I would do it like within a microcycle or a mesocycle. Uh, over the course of like a training year or training career, volume is one of the biggest levers that we can pull to sort of manage training load. Because over time, you're going to need more training load to match your new level of fitness provided it's going up. But if your fitness level is going down, then you'll need less training load. Sometimes that happens, with various things that come up in life. And so how do you know when you need to increase training load? And I think the main things that you need to focus on um, is one, am I still making progress or not? If you are making progress, it's really challenging for me to want to recommend a change, period, any change. So carry, carry on. Uh, we're assuming that that improvement in progress is real and not an artifact. And so what I mean by that is, you know, day to day, your performance, my performance, everybody on this, you know, Instagram Live, their performance oscillates. It ebbs and flows. It goes up and down within, a, a, you know, a, some non-zero percentage range. There's a ceiling and a floor, right? And I think based on the data right now that we have, it's probably somewhere between plus 5% and minus 5%. That's your kind of normal range. And so I would expect people over a three-week, four-week, more weeks period, if the program's working for them, their strength should trend up. Uh, above that sort of ceiling. So if anything greater than a 5% gain in strength, I tend to think is real, just like anything more than a 5% loss in strength that persists more than one session, I believe that is likely to be real. Um, so we can call that our 
minimal clinically important difference in strength because anything less than that, I think, is mostly artifact, right? So if someone is seeing progress, I'm probably not changing the training. If over four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, they're not really seeing progress, uh, then I start wondering, okay, are they overdone? Are they overcooked, right? Uh, is, are we cooked, chat? Or uh, do they, are they not uh, generating enough training stress from their current training load? And so you'd think about how's the, how are they sleeping? How's their motivation? Any injuries? Things of that nature. Uh, or do they feel fatigued? Are they sore all the time? And so you kind of got to weave your way through this a little bit of the art of programming. And it's an educated guess based on the, that sort of information. Um, and so if you think the person is doing well with the training, they're rating most of their sessions, you know, session RP four or five, something low, they're not really sore, they're sleeping well, they're highly motivated to train, um, no real injuries to speak of, their environment is resource rich, they're ready to go, they probably could use more training load and volume is one way to increase that. If on the other hand, they're super sore, very fatigued, tired, not motivated, burnout, whatever, it's like, mm, maybe the training load is actually too high and we got to dial it down. Um, so that uh, that is how I would, you know, you can use volume to adjust that. That's one parameter of many, right? And including intensity, proximity to failure, exercise selection. There's a lot of different changes here. And so in the new low fatigue uh, template, the second generation, I got a few pages on kind of how I think about this. Um, that was maybe what a few minutes, uh, but yeah, but there's more in that ebook that accompanies those programs, and you can see how that actually uh, shakes out in a real program. Um, so I would reference that if you have more questions on this. All right, the 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 votes are in. The stash works. We're gonna keep it through November. It is no shave November, so you know we'll see how unruly this thing gets. Um, if you're just joining us, just quick little plug. WayRx is back in stock. Um, this. In, in my mind, you know, we, we obviously don't do much advertising for our supplements, but the reason why we have a supplement line uh, is not to get rich. <laughs> in fact, I, I think some of the interactions that we have with other professionals or even people who uh, just interface with professionals on a regular basis, they're like, why do you have a supplement line? To them, it's a red flag. They're like, what are you just a grifter? You just, you know, hawking supplements. Well, the point is the supplement industry is not very good. And you guys all know that the regulation around the industry is is suboptimal and people put products out there that are not very good. Um, and so you'd want any supplement that you're taking to not only have evidence of efficacy um, in humans, but also a really good risk profile, so low risk. And then you'd also want it to be not contaminated. So to make sure that it doesn't have anything that you don't want in there um, when you buy it. And so to do our best and to do your best, you'd want to get supplements that are manufactured in a GMP accredited facility. You'd want ones that are batch tested by a third party organization, um, NSF, uh, Informed Sport, that's what we use, um, USP, those are the main players in the, in the United States. Uh, and then you'd want something that doesn't have any proprietary blends. And you'd also want a supplement that uh, has the correct amount of stuff that you want in there. So our protein is very simple, 90 calories, it's whey protein isolate, handful of ingredients. Um, it is priced, it, to be honest, not, it, it's cheaper than it should be. We're, we're the cheapest whey protein isolate um, out there. And uh, that is third-party tested, that is manufactured in a GMP accredited facility, and it's 90 calories. Um, and people say, oh, I can get it at Costco. I'm like, you can't get this at Costco. You cannot get a comparable product at Costco. It's just different. Um, no shade towards Costco protein if you use that, but if you're in the market for protein, you want to support what we do here at Barbell Medicine, you go to barbellmedicine.com, check out our way RX. Uh, if you want to stock up, there you go. All right. Gustavo underscore son is Pilates a valuable thing to add to training for a normal, healthy person who weight trains? Yeah, this is a great question. We have a podcast uh, that I did on Pilates, reviewing the evidence on it and its history and whatever. Um, it is not good for virtually anything that people do exercise for. <laughs> and what I mean by that, if you think about resistance training, what is the purpose of resistance training? Well, we want um, improved muscle quality, muscle function, in increases the muscle mass, so strength, hypertrophy, power, um, bone mineral density, uh, right? So all of these sort of, uh, we're applying resistance training to the human body to get all of these outcomes. Pilates is not good for that. Um, 
it's not good for strength, not good for hypertrophy, not good for bone mineral density because it doesn't load the skeleton enough. Um, so it's not good for that. It's not good for generating cardio cardiorespiratory fitness either. And so I view it as an accoutrement. If somebody is meeting or exceeding, ideally exceeding the current physical activity guidelines, and they want to do Pilates on top of that, that's fine. It's mostly like a, something that they enjoy doing. It's kind of like any other recreational activity. That's how I view Pilates. It's not a training modality. It's like recreation, which is fine. If somebody's asking me, look, if I did Pilates instead of doing more training, which is likely to get me better results, and, they, and by results they mean muscle mass, muscle strength, bone mineral density, muscle power, uh, balance, coordination, whatever, related to uh, producing force in a coordinated manner, well, it's not very good. It's not. It doesn't mean Pilates is bad. It's just it, it's good at getting better at Pilates. That's it. And it's great physical activity, um, just like anything else. So, yeah, I view it as an accoutrement, um, but I don't, uh, I don't recommend it to replace um, real exercise. And that's maybe the most <laughs> shade I'll throw at Pilates. I don't, I think it's fine. I've done Pilates before. Yes, it can be hard. There are a lot of hard things that people can do that don't really contribute to fitness. Um, Pilates is, is one of them at, at this time. Um, but yeah, certainly better than no activity, just not enough to qualify as strength training, not enough to improve muscle mass, not enough to improve cardiorespiratory fitness. Yeah, it's just recreation. Daniel Sarp. Is zone two cardio really that amazing for cardiorespiratory fitness and health? Um, simple answer, no. <laughs> uh, longer answer, it could be. <laughs> the thing is this, if someone is advertising zone two as like this panacea that you should only do your cardio zone two because it has the most robust effect on health, we would need some better evidence to show that to be the case. And in fact, a recent data, a recent study came out showing that um, higher intensity than zone two would be, is more efficient at improving health than moderate intensity. So they found the vigorous physical activity, um, you know, depending on the health condition uh, or uh, medical condition that you're assessing risk on, um, vigorous intensity physical activity was, you know, four times, five times, nine times as effective as moderate intensity physical activity, which zone two would fall into. doesn't mean that zone two is bad. Zone two can be very good. And so it can be useful when people are doing high volumes of conditioning. Um, and what I mean by that is like, they're doing way more than the current physical activity guidelines, which is at least 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous physical activity. And so um, if somebody's not doing, you know, a couple, you know, three hours, four hours, five hours of cardio uh, per week, endurance training per week, then I don't think it matters if they're doing a bunch of zone two stuff. I think it can be useful to to work up the training load, the training volume, because it's not very fatiguing. Um, so you can do more of it. But I still would expose people generally to some higher intensity work. You know, 80-20 is the traditional rule. 80% should be low and slow, moderate intensity, 20% would be a higher intensity, but that's only for people that are doing a lot of cardio work. If someone's only doing 60 minutes, 90 minutes, two hours, 120 minutes per week, I don't think it matters. This doesn't mean I would do only sprints, but I think more vigorous activity. So it's zone three, zone four. Yeah, it's all, it's all fine. Uh, but if somebody, if we're like directly comparing three hours per week of zone two versus three hours of zone three. I don't think there's a difference in outcomes. Three hours of zone two versus three hours of zone four. I don't think there's a difference. That's probably too much of the higher intensity work for, for some folks just uh, to tolerate. So, but that's, that's not unique to like the, the training uh, intensity is so much as it is the total training load, like how much and what intensity that you're doing it at.